Greeks were always easily impressed by thunder and lightning, and it was believed that thunder accompanied the presence of the gods, especially Zeus. Therefore, to make sure the worshippers in the temple were kept in constant awe, the priests had a little machine that they concealed in the temple's workspace. This machine is a slightly scaled down version of a thunder producing machine. We know that the Alexandrians had thunder machines from drawings and references of Heron. The machine he used consisted of metal balls falling onto a plate. Heron's machine was in fact a scaled up replica of Philon's alarm clock. Water is used as a timing mechanism in the machine. Now as the level rises, the float which is built into the bottom of the plate should begin to float and we'll see the plate gradually start to tilt. If this machine was sighted in the proper position, which would be above the worshippers, perhaps in a ceiling void on a suspended floor, the sound but also the vibration from the machine would resonate in the cavity below and it would produce presumably fear, panic, a whole host of different reactions. This is a replica of a medieval thunder machine. In writings from antiquity, there are references to similar machines that existed in the ancient world. The wooden box is a tube with a channel running the whole length of it. And within this tube run very heavy metal balls. This is actually an iron ball. And I've deliberately put these little bobbles on the outside to make it clatter more as it rolls. We simply operate the machine by tilting backwards and forwards like a seesaw. In antiquity, the hearts and minds of the masses were a battleground. Religion had to compete against many other forms of entertainment. In order to survive, priests became performers, showcasing acts of magic and trickery. The temple machines of Alexandria were extraordinary and awe-inspiring inventions that attracted many worshippers. People were also drawn to temples because of their beauty, scale and splendor. The priests ensured that their temples were places fit for gods to dwell in. It's a gateway to the gods. It's a house of the gods. And if you're housing an immortal being, it's got to be impressive. In the classical Greek period, the design of temples became standardized. Examples can be found not only in Greece, but all around the Mediterranean. Ancient Greek temples were put together in a quite particular way. There's an external colonnade. There are triangular gables or pediments at either end. Inside the colonnade, there's a walled building, which you entered through a very, very impressive door. And once you were inside, you would find yourself facing one or more divine statues. The most magnificent image of a god that we know of from the ancient world was a huge statue of Zeus, the most powerful of the gods at Olympia. The statue was famous for its extraordinary size and because it was so lavish, it was covered in golden ivory and set with precious stones. No doubt the congregation would have been awestruck as it towered above them. Inside the temple, placed in the center, is the very big and very impressive Chryselephantin statue of Zeus. This was the amazing work of the great sculptor Phidias, who having finished the statue of Athena at the Parthenon in Athens, came to Olympia, established his workshop, worked many years, and created this wonderful work, which was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But the statue of Zeus had a purpose, to evoke feelings of wonder and terror, and so reinforce the power of this most mighty of all the gods. It was a unique piece of work. Worshippers could enter the temple and climb the stairs found to the right and left of the statue and admire it from high. The impression, awe and fear it invoked was unique. All that remains of the Zeus temple which stood at Olympia are the statues which decorated the front entrance. 
the quality of the carving is a clue as to how magnificent the statue of Zeus must have been. The ancient Greeks were not only masterful artists that could create outstanding works, but they were also able to use their skills to shock. They had the technical expertise to make their statues cry tears of blood. In the ancient world, Heron and the other inventors of temple machines were skillful, resourceful and ingenious. The Alexandrian technologists were all interested in what we would now call physical concepts. The machine we have here is meant to illustrate one of these, how air, when it is heated, expands and so produces pressure. What we have is a sealed vessel, on top is a small fire, which would be the altar fire or temple fire. When the priest lights the fire to make the offering, the heat from the flames warms the air inside this chamber. The air then is pushed down the little tube into the receiving vessel, which holds, in this case, the fake blood. The pressure of that then forces the liquid through the tube here and up into the statue, and it will then go through two tiny holes in the tear ducts in the eyes of the statue. This was the type of mechanism at which Heron excelled. He used fire to push air into sealed containers. These, in turn, then moved fluids around other pipes. The effect was startling and could be used for devices such as the crying statue. But is it possible to recreate Heron's device using his technology? The hope was that as the fire heated the air, the air would expand and push through into the sealed container. The pressure would then hopefully cause the synthetic blood to rush up the pipe and through the tear ducts. There's no telling how quickly the air will actually heat up or in fact if it will heat up. Uh, most of the flames are burning upwards, so a lot of the heat is going upwards. Logic would suggest that the fire should be under the sealed container, but Heron's drawings indicate the opposite. The designs clearly show that he intended the fire to be on top, so that the offering could be placed on the fire in full view of the congregation. Everyone would then see that the goddess had been moved to tears by their gifts. Well, the fire's beginning to burn down a bit now, and um, the vessel is getting quite warm. Whether it's not completely sealed or whether the air is not expanding with sufficient pressure, we don't really know. But I can't see any sign yet of any fluid being driven out of the pipe. Richard believes that the model may be too small to allow a sufficient volume of air to expand. But a quick burst from a propane blowtorch soon gets it working. To see the all-powerful gods crying tears of blood must have been an astonishing and disturbing experience. Heron's designs, unrivaled in their brilliance and ingenuity, and his use of physics and hydraulics, provide tantalizing information for ancient technology experts like Richard Windley. Inventiveness and subtlety in a lot of these devices. There's lots of things in the drawings which seem to be nonsensical, and when one actually comes to the practical business of constructing them, you realize what these little devious elements are actually for. There's something very particular about reconstructing models because it kind of almost puts you in the brain space of the people that invented them. It gives a kind of keyhole of understanding into how they went about developing things. It was not only the everyday religions and cults of the ancient world that used machines and trickery to stun their congregations. There were cults of the time that had darker inner secrets and strange practices. These provided an ideal climate for some of the most mysterious inventions of antiquity. There were all sorts of bizarre cults. There were cults to all manner of gods and deities, and some of these took the most bizarre forms and rituals. One of the strangest of the cults was probably the cult of Cybele. The cult of the multi-breasted mother goddess Cybele had its origins in Asia Minor. But from the start, the cult of Cybele was associated with mystery, danger, and violence. It didn't help that in around the 9th century BC, when a priest tried to bring the religion to Athens, he was murdered. It's a cult which was given to extremes that were extremely unpalatable. We find, for instance, that one of the things...